All right, good afternoon, thank you. Um, so the, the, the topic of this event is uh, smart solutions for challenges facing humankind in the information age. So my, my presentation is going to be about the, sorry, oh, it's still not showing. Yeah. So I'm going to give a talk to help, help you understand the importance of privacy in this new world that we're going to and, uh, and also talk a little bit about something we're building for Sri Lanka, so everybody has a digital representation and digital ID in the country. Um, so let me, let me uh, motivate the problem a little bit from what, what we have to go through first, and then we'll talk a little bit about what comes next. All right, good. Um, so, the, the Sri Lanka government, like every other country, systems are becoming digital. So there are lots of different systems. So, at, uh, as citizens, uh, or as residents, or tourists, or anybody, you interact with multiple parts of the government. Uh, so, for example, there's the police, there's the education, there's the healthcare. Uh, there are the place that issues driving licenses, national ID, passport, all different parts of government that we have to go and interact with. Um, and there are different, and, and this applies not only for individuals but also for organizations. In, in, in the eyes of the government, the, there are legal entities that you interact with. A human being is a legal entity, a company is a legal entity, this organization is a legal entity, the military is a legal entity, and, and so forth, right? Uh, so there, the, the government as an organization interacts with legal entity, and there are many such different interactions. And if you look at what each of them have about each person, there is quite a bit of information that is kept by those organizations. And that's necessary. The purpose of a government, if you look at how a system is designed, why does a government exist? Uh, so government exists basically to provide some services for people and, and organizations and, and other uh, systems to depend on to do whatever they want to do. Right? And the role of a government is to provide that in a, in a fair and open and transparent way. Now we can, we can debate whether that happens in Sri Lanka and in most countries, but uh, ignoring that, the, the purpose of the government is to make it possible that when I drive on the road, there are some sort of rules that everybody has to follow on. If I buy a something, and then it becomes mine, and somebody else can't, can't just come and take it because they're stronger than you or bigger than you or more powerful than you, they can't just come and take it. So, so in order to implement that, the, the data is kept in different, different places. If you just look at, you can't read this, so don't worry about reading it. Right? Uh, the, if you look at just information about an individual, there are multiple parts of the government that contains information about an individual. So just, just starting uh, when you're born, there's the registrar, uh, the birth and marriage is registrar that records it. Uh, when you become 15, national ID gets involved and they give you a national ID. That's the uh, Department of uh, Registration of Persons. Uh, when you become 18, you get registered into the election system so you can vote. Uh, if you have driving license, there's a motor vehicle that gets information about you. Uh, if you travel, you get a passport, and so on. Right? And all of these organizations, if you look at how the government is structured again, there's an act of parliament that says, this is what you guys are supposed to do. And this information you are allowed to collect in order to do what you're supposed to do. Uh, and so that's all good, and that's a necessary thing, but it's, it's connected information. It's, eventually, it's about me. Right? There's information about me. I'm the same person, it's the same different parts of the system that, that captures it. So what's, what's the problem here? Uh, so the problem is that as a user of the system myself, there's duplication information. Every place I go to, I have to fill a form saying what's your home address, right? Or what's your national ID, what is your whatever, whatever information you keep on giving every single time. Uh, so it's really inconvenient. And, and it's also a, a privacy problem because I'm giving my information to everybody uh, and most people don't need to have it. So for example, when I walk into a building in Sri Lanka, if, there, if there's any security consciousness going on there, they'll ask you to register, right? And that's not only in Sri Lanka, all over the world, they'll ask you to register, they'll ask you some ID. Most of us give our national ID, because that's what we have as a way of identifying ourselves. When you give the national ID, you're also telling the person your date of birth. Uh, and, and, and gender and, and everything is in the national ID. Uh, now gender doesn't matter if you're there, they know your gender. 
But date of birth is not relevant for that person to know that I went into this building. Right? What they want to know is if there's a problem later on, you can find out who went into the building and you have to associate back to that person. Right? So there's a lot of privacy information that is uh, not shareable in that way. Uh, 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 I think you mentioned about uh, kind of uh, summary question about uh, Sweden and having only one number. The problem with one number is if, if, if the system, if everybody in the government uh, has information about your relative and it's all tied to one number, if someone else finds out that number, they can find all information about you. And in a digital era, the information is the power that is how you control, uh, control things. So as a citizen, everybody has to think about how much do I want to allow somebody to take control of everything I do. Right? So, so the lack of knowing something is actually very powerful. Is a powerful component of being free. If you want to maintain freedom, you can't let everybody else know everything, everything about you. It doesn't work like that. If you allow somebody to know everything about you, you have no freedom. Basically, right? So, so there's a trade-off. Now, government, in order to do its job, has to know something about you. If I want to get healthcare, they have to know your medical record. If I want to go to school, I need to know, I need to give some information about when I was born because that affects at what level I start, that my grades have been known so that they can assess and maintain and so forth. But if I'm, uh, if I'm applying for a job, the employer shouldn't be able to find out whether I have a health condition. Now in Sri Lanka, you'll often see uh, companies will say, now we won't hire women because they get, especially the other women, because, or they might get married and get pregnant and you'll give them, they go off on a, you know, a, whatever the, the uh, 84 days of leave, right? Uh, that's, that's not fair, that's discrimination. A, a, now, uh, and if somebody has some sickness, and if it's not a visible sickness, they have some sickness internally, yeah, an employer will say, well, if, if they're sick, they don't want to hire them because they'll, they'll take sick leave. Right, or they get sick all the time. Again, not fair. If the systems are integrated so that you can actually find that out, that becomes a big problem. So you want you want digital integration, you want information to work across, to flow across, but you don't want it shared arbitrarily. You want it shared under very strong control, very strong privacy control, under the owner of the information. So if it's information about me, I should be able to say, yes, I want to give it to that person. And if it's uh, and, and if if I want information about you, if I ask for it, there should be some systematic way of you explicitly authorizing saying yes, I want to give this information. And therefore, I transfer the information to you. And and uh, uh, so so it's very important to have this privacy management component of how information is managed in this era that we're going to where everything is built around information. And software systems are making over everything. Primarily robotics, right? So, uh, from the talk we just said, if that robot is learning, that means it's gathering information from it. It's not learning means. Right? Listen to you, get information, process, and derive a higher model than I can act with you better. That's okay, but now if that information is shared back to some manufacturer of that, they can sell that or they can use that to market stuff back to me. That's not okay. Now you can say if you're an adult, it's a choice you make. You press that, you know, when you, when you buy something or a software, you sign up to a website, you know, the terms of service we all accept, right? How many of you read it? <laughs> Nobody, right? I don't read it. Because it's all legal mumbo jumbo. And if you read it, it always says, well, we can do whatever we want with it, and if something happens to you because of that, they're not allowed to. Fundamentally, that's what it says. If you read it, and, and, and what's your choice? You don't want to use Gmail? Okay, I. I can go to Yahoo Mail, read the Yahoo Mail, one, same thing, go to Microsoft, one, same thing. So there's no choice, you have to accept that, right? So, so, the, the, uh, so, but as children, if you if you allow children, that's why app stores, for example, don't allow children, if it's known that the child is using the, the device, don't allow children to install an app. Because legally, you can't hold the child liable for making that decision. And adult, you can say, well, you know, you restrict, I accept, so tough luck for you, right? Not for a child. So there are lots of complications that come up with this privacy aspect. Now coming back to the system side, if I'm building infrastructure for government, it is actually a pain to have this duplicate information. And I don't have uh, correct information all the time. So take your address. If I move, now I actually under Sri Lankan law, the ground there is supposed to know who's living in the area. Right? So they have, they have, if you need an address proof, the place you go to is the ground level there. So they have, they have a record. Now there's a system that's built actually that is going to get deployed where the ground level will have a fully digital infrastructure for this. 
and you can log in and say I want an address proof and it will just uh, print it out and have it ready to pick it up and I'll email it to you whatever. Uh, so, so when I go somewhere, nobody should ever have to ask for an address proof after that, ideally. They should just, I should authorize saying you can go to the Grammy Data system and get my address and here's my some kind of token so you know who I am. And then it will go pick up that address. And then if the address changes, the system will automatically update. So if I move somewhere, I don't need to go and change my address everywhere. Right now, my address on my national ID is my, my parents' address when I draw because it's 15, that's why I, I, I got the thing. When I get a phone, if I don't get that address, I have to carry a light bill or something, right? Showing that it's no address. Now, how did the light bill get my address? Well, that's because when I bought the house or you signed a lease agreement that gets registered, that becomes your official address. Right. So, so all of this should be connected. It's very important. And that's really what we're trying to, what we have to build if you want to make the system work better. So there are two fundamental keys to building this kind of system. One is digital ID, the other is interoperable data architecture. So I'm going to briefly explain this, but not get into detail. Uh, so digital ID, I, I'm going to explain the concept of digital ID a little bit. I, for those of you who know it, I apologize, but, but I think it's important to understand what does it actually mean, digital ID. The idea of digital ID is somehow is the idea of going to some kind of online system and being able to prove to that system that you are you. So what does you mean, first of all? In, in, the, in the ultimate case, you means your DNA signature. That is, at the hardware level of a human being, that is a, that is a unique signature. Right? Now, obviously, that doesn't work if you're a company. If you're trying to prove that I am this company, you need something else. You're trying to prove I am a, a, a vehicle, I did something else. So ID, so there's some ID and some factors that associate those two and say you are that person. In the case of websites and online mechanisms, typically it's some kind of a username. Right? You have some username, you log in by saying here's my username, here's my password. To prove that, so somewhere you got a username. And at the point of getting the username or sometime later, you have to associate that and say, well, that's actually me. For example, I can create a Facebook account Okay, uh, the reason there was one, when, uh, when uh, Sajid Premadasa was uh, announcing that he was running for president, somebody went and bought sajidpremadasa.com. And if you went to sajidpremadasa.com, it used to take you to go to another LK. Right? That's because on the internet, there is no identity requirement for domain names. As in, uh, you know, anybody can buy, there's no association. The, the name Sajid Premadasa has no meaning on the internet. So I can go and buy some, uh, some is available to sale if you want to go and buy it, I'm sure the guys are selling it for some price now. Uh, you can go and buy it and you can put up whatever you want on that site. It, 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 so that's not a, therefore, that is not a provable, that's not an ID. So similar to usernames, I can create a Facebook account saying Sajid Prevodas or about Avid Alpha, so whatever I want, right? And, and that's, they're all over the place, there are lots of accounts that have those names. Right. We, I think last presidential election we had multiple minor other boxes running, if I remember right. Because by law, you know, a name is just a name, right? So it has no association with the person. It, uh, so so uh, in order to prove that whatever the digital ID that you have is actually you, you have to resort to some other mechanism to associate yourself with that digital ID. So in Sri Lanka, if you are a Sri Lankan citizen, that mechanism is a national ID. The national ID is supposed to be, you know, for legally valid purposes, if you take a national ID and show somebody and they say, yeah, that's you, that's you. Right? You can open a bank account, you can get a SIM, you can get married, you can do anything with that national ID. Uh, so, so you need a way to associate the digital ID that is being given to this person with that national ID by somebody in authority. And once you connect them together, you know, okay, if you have the name sadhipremanasa.com and, and that's sadhipremanasa is your user ID, and that happens to be associated to me, then if I log in with that thing, then it's me, not somebody else, by, in a legally binding manner. Right? That is what you have to set up in order to make that work. Then, then when you have a digital ID, you have to prove that you are holding that digital ID. Uh, by the way, I'm colorblind, so I'm going to have to keep track of your accounts. I wouldn't tell the difference between red, green, and yellow at all there. So. But I, the third one is the one I have to stop at, that's all I remember. Uh, I'm completely colorblind. So. Um, so to prove something that you are the person holder of a digital ID in, in identity management speak, there are three three concepts typically. That is something that you that something that you know, something that you have, and something that you are. So the idea is something that you know means I can ask you for a password, I can ask you for a pay number. So when you go to a bank account with your ATM card, when you go to an ATM machine with your card and get money, 
you are taking something you have and something you know, and you put the thing into that machine, you type in the pin number, and it gives you money. Right? That is why they tell you, don't write down the pin number and keep it next to the car. Because you put both forms of credential together. If you do that, it becomes basically completely unsafe. The third one is something you are, like biometrics, like fingerprint, spatial recognition, DNA, whatever you want to go to. Right? Combining these is what gives you what is known as multi-factor authentication. So which is you are saying, tell me one thing and another thing. That's stronger than only asking for one thing. If I ask only for one thing, I'm only getting a, that kind of verification. When you log into Facebook typically or, or Twitter or LinkedIn or anything, you typically log in with your username and you type in a password and that's it. Most places now encourage you to, or, uh, to enable two-factor authorization. If you haven't done that, you should do that. What that means is you are now saying this is my username and password and I'm going to prove that this is my phone number or something like that. A typical one is SMS or TP, that means uh, over the top SMS. That means it sends an SMS to your phone with a code and you have to type in that code. So if you don't have the phone, you can't log in even if you know my password. Right? That's a very good thing to do. Uh, that's a multi-factor. Then multi-step is you can ask multiple things. So for example, websites, bank websites have some kind of a secret question concept. You ask for a password, then it says, what was the answer to the second secret question you gave? Right. So you come up with a question, you write an answer, only you know that. Right? So you can put that in. Okay? Now, of course, the other thing, uh, and there's something called adaptive authentication, which basically means I don't have to always ask you all these questions because it's really annoying. If in order for me to log in to do something, I have to answer three things and put my fingerprint somewhere and look at the thing, match this or it up to my face, it's really annoying. Right. Adaptive authentication is let me learn the situation and ask you just enough. And if you've already proven yourself to something else recently, then I can assume that you're the same person. And the software becomes very intelligent about how it decides how much authentication to do. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so one more very quick thing. Uh, uh, this concept of smart card, a lot of smart identity card. A lot of people carry around these smart ID cards, and I know government is also issuing for various scenarios. Uh, this is not a digital ID card. There's a chip in it with some data in it, but it's still a physical ID card. And yes, even if you have a card reader and read what's in there, uh, that only tells you that whatever the person putting this card is matching whatever that you have said. Uh, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't, it cannot be used to log into a website. Uh, so in my personal opinion, these have no place in the world anymore. Even Estonia, which is a country that started using smart ID cards first, is now moving away from this because it's just not worth it anymore uh, to use this kind of stuff. But, uh, very briefly about data. Uh, so it's interesting when you have a government and you have data, uh, the ownership or the responsibility of, of, of being, being uh, the one to dish out the official version of the data is assigned to somebody already. So for example, if you want to know your date of birth, Officially, the official place is the registrar of birth and marriages that can issue that things and this is the person. That's why they are the ones who issue the birth certificate. Right. Like that, there's a very defined structure. Uh, um, uh, data is duplicated everywhere in government systems. Fundamentally, this is okay. Uh, the main thing you want is to make sure that when the data is copied, that, that the copy is coming from the original place, not from some random place. Then, then, then it's quite okay to have a duplicate of the data. Uh, and, and if there's something about what we're building, I won't really get too much. Uh, change, so data can also be changed, right? As time goes along, uh, data needs to be changed. You need a way to distribute data around. Uh, I also need to be able to allow access to the data to other people. Uh, the whole point of building an infrastructure for data sharing in a, in a managed, secure way is that when I go to get a, when I go to buy a movie ticket, I don't need to type in my my. Uh, Go to so let's say I want to buy a new SIM, right? And if I give some kind of credential to go and tell them, saying I'm this person, they should be able to pick up my address. As long as I approve, they should be able to pick up my address, whatever is information they want from that. So that the system, with my approval, will translate information to that system and not have to be, uh, allow me to force everything there. And that's what the data access architecture is about. So there's a platform that we're going to be building called the National Data Identity. Uh, interoperability platform. Um, uh, and, and the problem we're trying to solve is that give entities, both people and organizations, 
a single digital ID with which they can securely access any government system. Uh, but do it in a way that doesn't allow anybody to hack through that and get data across all the systems. There's a lot of technical detail behind this. There's a public design document. Anybody will come to look at it and comment. Uh, and, and the way that is done is to create a, what's called a, a persistent pseudonym for each dependent system and then integrate all that together in, in a very secure way. Uh, and it can be done. Uh, and that's what we're going to be building. Uh, and give, also give a way to share data across different organizations in a structured way. Um, provide and, and provide a, a way for the data owner, thank you, uh, the data owner to know when there is a data transfer happening. So for example, one of the things that you have to worry about when you have data, so if I want to find out, uh, let's say I'm a person in power and I want to find out who are all the, 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 the males between age 27 and 30 in a particular area, right now you can't find that out. Let's say school teachers, I want to find out who are the school teachers for 25 to 30, right? The personal files are somewhere, the only way to find that out is dig through the personal files and find them. Actually, as of right now, Ministry of Education has a system that, that uh, has all school teacher data in, in a system and they can ask that question in, in, in a fraction of a second now. But uh, that information can be abused. Right? Someone can say, well, okay, let me ask who are the female teachers who are between 25 and 30 who are unmarried who are in this area. Right? That's not information you want anybody, anybody in power just to do it just when they feel like asking for it. Um, so so there's, a, there's a delicate balance you need to do in terms of there are some reporting that you need, mostly anonymized, summarized data, but the results involving personal information about a person shouldn't be pushed out even through a person in authority. And if it has to be pushed out, the person itself should be notified saying, hey, your data should have been a report. Uh, for example, on LinkedIn, if you have a LinkedIn account, it shows you how many times you showed up in a, result, a search. The reason it does that is for this purpose, so that people are looking at you, basically. Right? And if you're being looked at by multiple times by the same person, then there should be a protocol for making a complaint about it, saying, hey, why, why are they looking at me all the time? Right? Why am I special? Because, you know, in a, in a country, no individual should be special to show up in searches. Right? Now, there's a, there's a legitimate need for security purposes, right? There should be a way, if the police is investigating a crime, they shouldn't be triggering notification to you just because they're investigating and then, then you hide whatever you know because they know that you know you're the investigator. So there's an architecture to support that as well. So if there's a legitimate request, sort of an authorized request with the right permissions behind it, then it will not trigger that information, but it will get logged. So later on if there's a problem and somebody has to query that, there will be a log of it so you can actually analyze it. Right. Um, so what, you have to do all this stuff while preventing these two things. One is prevent data abuse, which is we don't want any kind of big brother scenario, the concept called big brother, which is the government that knows everything uh, and being able to abuse data. And at the same time, also preventing uh, a hacker, even if they hack into one system, to be able to integrate all the information together. Because that is the, that's a huge risk. If, if one person can get all the information from all the systems. Right now, it's impossible in Sri Lanka, it's impossible in most countries, because the systems aren't connected. And there's no unique number across all the systems. So even if I hack in for one thing, I can't correlate the information, no, get all the information about any of you guys across every system. So we don't, that's a good thing, we want to prevent this. So there's an architecture for this, this is, uh, uh, I won't, I won't get into the way. Uh, also you have to think about people who don't have digital access and capability. So there are, there are older people, younger people, uh, people who are not a, 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 without internet access, so you can't, you can't build a system that is only dependent on digital infrastructure and run a country because there's a significant fraction of the country that doesn't and will not have digital access or will not want to have digital access, right? So there's ways of solving that as well. Uh, there's a cabinet proposal that's going in for this. This is going to be done as a non-profit effort uh, by the Akka Software Foundation with the ICT agents and the digital ministry. Uh, so because this is an interoperability infrastructure for the government. Without this, we can't build proper government systems. And this is, uh, uh, and then integrate that to various key entities to start off with. So uh, the register uh, of persons, the immigration, immigration, uh, election, education, uh, ground and diary, all of these things. And then even that for third party use as well. So if a private company wants to use this access to the system, to pull data about you or something, they can, but it will trigger notification, it will trigger all, all the infrastructure that's there, it will be triggered. All right, so, so uh, the, in order to make the digital experience really good going forward, you have to have the systems work together. 
Facebook is nice because when I log into Facebook and do something, everybody who's connected to my ecosystem can find out. And I can find out what's going on. In order to do that, they have built a massive information graph behind them. Uh, that's what you want to have, even for public sector and for everything, but you want to do it in a way that does it in the right way without allowing uh, the risk of uh, um, abuse of that. And it's important also to remember that it's not just about citizens. Uh, so that's why you can't just use a national ID number as an ID. Uh, there are, there are non-residents, there are tourists, uh, there are e-citizens, people who are, for example, somebody who's a director of a company in Sri Lanka who doesn't live in Sri Lanka. They are, they are an interested party for our system to work, but we have no way to identify them right now. So we need to identify them and, and connect them up, right? Uh, and, and, and of course do it in a way that uh, privacy and so forth is maintained. Uh, so all of this stuff is done in completely open source. The source code is open, anybody who's technical can contribute and can review, and, and all the documentation, design, everything is public as well. All right, I'm over time, thank you very much. Questions to Dr. Vivarna. It's all about your identity, so you should be interested in knowing more about it. What's the relation between NSTI and special data infrastructure in your business? Yeah, NSTI is not an individual terminal, there is. So for example, all the, the spatial models that we are using are based on what's being done there. And life is part of it too, actually. Not kind of improperly framework, as I mentioned. And life has to be resurrected, it's kind of dead. Uh, kind of that. But that, that will become part of this as well, yeah. But this is more focused on individual and, so NSA is more about spatial representation. But basically, what does it Yeah. Uh, there's connectivity of this, right? So if I, if you want to associate this land or property, the uh, individual owns land, and how is that land identified, and all that is still done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so now uh, we look at these solutions. As I see, we have three worlds. Like physical world, we have a few customers, systems, and the other one is, of course, the virtual one. In between, we have the embedded world. So are you proposing some kind of a mapping to one single instances? Oh, one single instance. Oh, what is the CPI? No. So, 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 if you look at what a gov if you look at a government very abstractly, right? right? A government is a system that provides a set of services for a, some other group of things to operate, right? A, that set of services, obviously, country to country varies, but there's a set of services that it offers in some form. Uh, this is about the people who interact with the government. And by people, I don't mean individuals, I mean legal entities. The government only works with legal entities. Right? Identifying all of those things, if that happens to be a car, so for example, imagine in, in the future, there's an autonomous car that the car has no owner, has no driver, and you know some American company makes it and it's running around here. It's not a far-fetched situation that is absolutely going to happen. Then the car itself might be a legal entity. Now what the hell are you going to do when the car runs over somebody? Because you can shoot the car, but what good does that do, right? You know, so, but, but, so he, 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 this, this system is about whatever the legal entity is, I don't care. Whether it's an embedded device, an IoT device, a human being, a company, a government department, doesn't matter. And giving them an ID so they can be uniquely using government infrastructure. And that's it, no more than that. And, and doing it in a way, I, I didn't get into the details, but one, one, in order to build this kind of system that crosses the government, you can't, you cannot say, let's go and redesign how national ID works, how passports works, how driving license works. This is done very carefully, saying they can continue working the same way, and we are overlaying a virtual digital ID infrastructure on top of all of those things. Otherwise, we'll never get it done. How do you make the relationship between the public and private? That's the privacy control. That is exactly yes. So, a, a, the, uh, no information about a person is made available publicly under any condition. It's up to the person to decide with the privacy controls. Uh, so there will be something called a privacy portal that you can log in and you can choose how much information you want to share, when you want to be notified, under what conditions you want to be notified, how you want to be notified, all of that. Uh, 
these things we can uh, capture the terrorist or the practicing nature or something. So how about the government the perspective on this in the legal background and security and other things? Because there are there are technologies. Yeah. They are already developed. So they have seen to uh happen those things in Sri Lanka. So Right. So so uh, so to ask is so uh, what is the uh, legal status and path for say point facial recognition, facial recognition at large scale. Um, technology is there, uh, great completely. Personally I don't like the idea of buying that kind of technology from anybody because we don't know what the hell the software does when you buy software like that. So all of this stuff is being built and it's open source being done by us and, and uh, we expect other countries to use the software but it's open source so anybody can see it. And most of the technology you can buy for this scenario that you're describing is not open source. Uh, and so, but anyway, that's a different matter. The, 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 uh, so, for example, if I if I attach a camera to my car and I record, I actually wrote up a design for a system like this some time ago, where we give everybody a camera into their car, and you just tell people because when the car is on the road, I have a right to see that car. Right? You can't tell me close your eyes where I can see your car. I can see your car, and I can see your number. And if I take a picture, I know where your car was at what time. So if I gather all the information from all the cameras saying what are the cars you see, I get a complete picture of every car on the road at every time. And then if I just, this is what Google does from a different perspective. And then if I connect all that information, I can know exactly where you're going, when you're going, how you're going, who you're going, everything. Right? You cannot stop that by law right now. Because it is legally possible for me to collect, to have a camera in front and record. Now, if I collect all the information and share it publicly as a public service where I can type in your vehicle number and get a map of where you went, yeah, that probably will violate some law, I don't know. Uh, uh, the, coming back to the personal uh, like, you know, surveillance, video surveillance and so forth, I think that there has to be a national security point at which you have to say, sorry, we have to be able to do this. Uh, UK, for example, has cameras everywhere. I think London is the most uh, surveilled camera city in the world. Uh, and they use that a lot to track uh, somebody when they identify someone. The key thing is the systems within government must be solid to prevent abuse in order to make that kind of work work. Right? People have to trust that government will not abuse this unfairly against people they don't like. That trust is there in the UK government by the UK people. I don't trust the UK government for that. I'm not a UK person. Right? When I go, uh, I'm not a US person. When I go to the US, I know I'm tracked completely. Right? Because I'm a foreigner, I know, they know exactly what time I came in. Right? All foreigners are tracked and so forth. I have no rights in that country, so that's okay. We should do the same to foreigners here. Because we have the same right to protect the country and there are foreign people in doing now, Sri Lanka, uh, so far, terrorism has come from Sri Lanka, it's not from foreigners. So it's really not an anti-terrorist move to say we're going to uh, surveil foreign citizens in Sri Lanka. It's not relevant. Uh, for local citizens, we have to, the citizens, the government has to earn the trust of the people that it is okay that the government will do it and do it properly. Right now, that's a hell of a stretch. Right? People won't trust, given the history of our governments for the last many years, there's, that trust is not there. And then if you put on top of that thing, oh, we're buying something from China or Israel to build the software for running that, that brings another question of, so it's a really difficult thing to get through at this point in this Sri Lanka. And I personally wouldn't want it because of those reasons for myself. I wouldn't want to be recorded and processable at that level. So it's, it's a difficult balance.